because I thought I would be only on in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, let me improvise. I would like to create this speech a little bit interactive, even though I only have about 15 minutes, I was told. I prefer connection, because this is what it's about, what I'm going to speak about this evening. It really is about words that either disconnect us or create connection between human beings. And feedback is one of the strongest resources for personal development, for personal insight, and for trust and connection between human beings. I would like to say a few words about myself. I'm 48 years old, I live in Germany, I have a son, he's 16 and a half years old, and he's given me lots of opportunities to deal with difficult messages. I can tell you that, so I've grown a lot from that. And um, like um, some speakers have said, I work as an executive coach, so I work with people who have a lot of responsibility in leading other human beings, so how they speak, how they have a stance in life, and how they talk and communi communicate to other people is extremely relevant. Feedback in my life, what does it mean? I would like to mention a few very personal things, because I believe feedback is not only about somebody, adult, coming and asking and requesting for feedback and then hoping to deal with it in a good way. I think feedback also comes from life, especially when you're about this age. Then life teaches you about something. It teaches you about who you are in life, who you are supposed to be, and who you are not allowed to be. First feedback I can remember in my life was quite difficult, I must say. I was about six or seven years old, and I was taken from the, the classroom, and the headmaster and some other people were telling me, you were at your girlfriend's house yesterday, and they were the grandparents, and they are saying that you stole money from them. And I was like six years old. And I couldn't believe what they were saying to me. But it really formed me for the rest of my life. I know that. The first time I received feedback was when I encountered people, my teachers, from nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication was founded by Marshall Rosenberg. He was a psychotherapist and he developed these four steps of communication. And these four steps of communication have today become the most important part of what I call mediation. I don't know how many of you know about mediation, but it's conflict resolution at its finest and the central part of it consists of empathy. How do I provide empathy? I would like to um, <clears throat> tell you a little bit about the, the attitude or the stance or the key assumptions of nonviolent communication. And this is why I like this. Just to give you a little input. Oh, but now then you can't see. So I have to stay back. <laughs> All right. So it's four key assumptions we have, and I think they are crucial to how we can be different in the world, speaking to other people, but at the same time also receiving messages from other people when they tell us something that they see in us and our behavior. And the first key assumption is that all human action is based or is there to, to serve and fulfill human needs. All human actions, what we do, what we say, what we don't do, what we don't say, is there because we are trying to fulfill human needs. Yeah? All human actions, whether we like them or not. The second thing is, all human beings share the same needs. And I don't know whether you really experience it that way, especially when you have somebody that you do not really appreciate, that you do not appreciate how they behave, how, how they show up in the world. But we all have the same, the same needs. And this is also cross-cultural. Is this something you, can, you object to? I wonder. <laughs> So the basic human needs, whether I'm Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Egyptian, it doesn't matter. We all share the same basic human needs. Even when we have conflicts, we realize it. Human beings enjoy, contribute.
contributing to the well-being of others, another assumption that we strongly believe in. Let me say that when we give feedback, why am I doing this? Why am I giving somebody feedback? Is it because I want to give them something? Is it for me? I don't know how you see it. But if I give feedback, I should really know how, how, I, how am I thinking about this person? Am I trying to get at something that they have done to me? What's the relationship between that person and me? And I have to become very clear on the relationship between this person and myself in order to give the constructive, positive, and the other one you said? The positive, constructive, and... Finally. <laughs> I didn't say that. That, you, that you practice here as well. So it's very important. So we enjoy contributing. So this could be the energy of giving feedback to other people, which is like, oh, you want to grow? You want to become a better human being? So I'm honored that you're asking me to give you feedback because I, as a human being, if we have a good and trusting and sustainable relationship, I would love to contribute to that. So it's an honor. One more thing is emotions and feelings. I don't know how you experience it, but sometimes when you get feedback and somebody gives it to you and they say it in some words that you don't really feel good about, then it could be that some feelings come up. And feelings are very important in nonviolent communication because we understand them as very important messengers about what needs of mine are fulfilled and what not. And I seem to remember in the, in the, the Toastmasters effective evaluation that you all probably have read at some point or another, to give feedback as a Toastmaster means to fulfill members' needs. And I suppose members' needs are, the same as I understand them, to grow as a person, as a leader, as somebody taking responsibility in their life. And at the same time, if you give feedback, you only have 50% of the responsibility of how that person receives your feedback. Because the other person also has 50% in how they hear it. And you have no influence on it. I would like to propose, I don't know how much time I have left, because I'm dancing around the front here. <laughs> I would like to propose one way of giving feedback or getting, getting clear to give a positive and constructive feedback, which is if you start thinking about, hmm, what if I just observed, like you are observing me, you are observing me moving around, so what are you observing? Not to get confused between observation and how you interpret me. Maybe you don't like Germans. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe something about me reminds you of your... The Troika. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, just to make sure, we want to discriminate or distinguish between an observation and our interpretation of what somebody is doing. I'm writing very fast because I'm trying to save time. One very, I think, very wise man once said, one of the highest forms of human intelligence is to be able to observe without judgment. I believe that's so true. It's so true. It's so true. And we can only strive for that. And I think the most important thing is to, to know and to sense and to realize when am I observing? And this is something a film camera could do. So what am I seeing and what am I actually hearing? And what is it that it's really doing to me? And what does it make you think of? And what are my associations and whatnot? And those are the stories I tell myself. But it's not an observation. And it probably doesn't have much to do with the other person. So it's good to distinguish. So the second thing <coughs> we um, look at in nonviolent communication if somebody does something, if somebody says something, 
as you have heard, you know, you, you're supposed to be talking about your reaction and then come to an opinion and that's what you transmit. If you observe something, it does something to you, obviously. Yeah, you're not objective, you're subjective. So it will do something. And probably, most probably, do something that will also stir some feelings in you. Either of being comfortable, or being boring, or I can't believe she's doing this. Some kind of feeling will, will stir in you. And I'm proposing that noticing these feelings are very, very important because they are important messengers about the most important thing I told you about before, our needs. And we don't want to mix them up with something that I call strategy. So, I think it's important as someone who gives feedback or who receives feedback, when I give feedback, am I really into contributing to the development of the other person or is there something else at play at the same time? And when I receive feedback, what needs of mine are being fulfilled when I listen to what the other person has to say? And I think this is quite important to take responsibility of what of the feedback am I really taking in? And then I reflect it, I check it. But sometimes somebody is giving me feedback and I'm like, I just don't know whether you're talking about me or about yourself right now. <laughs> yeah? So you have to really take responsibility and to make the discrimination between is, is Peter talking about Paul or is Peter talking about Paul and talking indirectly about himself. So this is my responsibility when I receive feedback. And I would like to tell you just uh,